Hello, Hello, Dr. Miller. Can you see me? I can see you. Good. <laughs> I see you are quite relaxed there. As per usual. <laughs> it, was, it was hailing today, so what's not to be relaxed about? Absolutely. Yes, nice and sunny. So <laughs> um, that is Dr. Miller. Uh, so he will be, I have already uh, introduced, uh, these are our, yes. <laughs> Uh, I hope he can. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. So uh, he will be talking about uh, um, his presentation on which I have already introduced to you. So if you can uh, just share your screen with us, please, so that we can okay. see your presentation. Right. I'll see how my technological skills yeah. are. <laughs> um, welcome to my presentation. Right, so what I'm going to be speaking about, it's about um, a high flood risk area where there is low vulnerability and some of the challenges there in terms of building flood resilience in an area which is so socially and economically deprived. Um, so a bit of outline of what I'll be covering today. I'll give you a bit of background to the study area, which is based in North Wales, um, Kinnell Bay rail area. A little bit about the level of vulnerability and some research we have done, how we've created a risk mapping using GIS, and understanding about resilience. What are the challenges in building resilience? For And a key part of that is understanding about local perception of the risk that they're exposed to. And then I probably pose a few questions to you um, in the end about, you know, how do you build resilience in this area? But before I do that, I got, I heard the latter part of Stephen's presentation. So if you can hear me well enough, I'm going to actually start off with Stephen's question. I can't see you guys, but I suspect, suspect you can see me. Yeah. No. Hello. Are you hearing me? Yes. Can you hear us? Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm going to pose a question. Yeah. If there was a flood in your area, okay. would you take action? And this is coming from Stephen's earlier presentation. I can't see you, but Nemrat, if you could tell me a count of hand, yeah. what percentage okay. are saying they would take action and those who wouldn't take action? Okay, so if there is a flooding in your area, would you take action yourself, not think about the government coming and taking? No, so, would you take action? Yeah. Would you take action? Uh, we, he wants uh, ra uh, to raise your hands who would and who wouldn't. Okay, there are four. Yeah, everybody is kind of feeling like they want to raise their hands. They want to raise their hands. <laughs> yes. Right. So, so that's the expectation. For, for a community who is resilient and understandable flood, you would assume they would want to take action. Well, in this particular area, it's a little bit different, and we're going to explore why where you know you're aware of the risk you've experienced it but you decided not to take action and what are some of the reasons for that so if i give you a quick run out of where kimnell bay is as i said it's located um in 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 in, in wales and that's a little good earth map to give a quick overview so it's a quite a big catchment area um there's the river cloid that's run into the Irish Sea towards the north, and the community we are dealing with is that's Rill, Kimnell Bay, and it goes further down, as it, we'll go down in a minute, goes down to, to um, Towin. So as you can see, it's a pretty low line area uh, with a big river catchment, is exposed to tidal floods, as well as pluvial floods, which I know Stephen asked a question either. But as you move towards the west, which is coming up now, you can see what we call caravan or holiday homes here. And you can see a little bit of the sea defense. Now, that area here, which I'm just circling, is quite important because that's the area, the 1990 floods that was breached. All of this area was again flooded in 2013, 2014. You can see some of the natural dunes still in. You can see a number of fields being prepared for um, caravan um, home, and we'll talk about why some of these areas, they're particularly vulnerable to flooding. So a bit of background about the flooding in the area. It has a very long continuous history of flooding around rail, Kimnell Bay. 
1990, the year which I mentioned earlier on, there was a massive breach um, around that area. Again, a result of um, high tide, high wind, storm surge, um, but also something that happened, for example, in, in, in Katrina, Hurricane Katrina in America, poorly maintained um, defenses. The defense breached in a number of places. And as a result, over 2,800 homes were flooded and quite significant number, 5,000 people were evacuated as a result um, of that flood. Now, you'd expect that, you know, for a country like the UK, they would respond, they would strengthen the flood defenses, that area wouldn't be flooded again. But that was repeated as recent as 2013, 2014, and then a lesser extent um, in 2017. In 2013, which is more the most significant one, and I, I sort of play this video, that's the area that was breached in 1990. And if you speed that up later to 2013, um, again, you can see how significant the flood flooding was around that um, area around Kindle Bay Rail um, and some of the, the um, impact that it had. Now, recent um, models looking at climate change shows that, you know, if they use the maximum probability of climate change, that area would literally become an inhabitable um, by 2100. So it has a long history of flooding. There's a history of recurring floods and you'd expect in the UK context for it to be at least more resilience. Government would take more initiative in terms of building not just resistance, but resilience measure. So you might all come across this from before about hazard, vulnerability, what contributes to risk. Now, I'm not gonna focus so much on the hazard today. Um, the hazard, you know, when you think about the hazard, you have to think about the speed, the magnitude, the duration, the extent, the intensity. Now, in its commonest form, risk is about hazard times vulnerability. Where if you look at vulnerability, vulnerability is about exposure, um, sensitivity, susceptibility, but the big one is resilience. So in a way, you can have very high exposure, but if resilience is, is high, then the risk is low. But if resilience is extremely low, which is the divider, then risk is very, very high. So we're gonna explore risk and why the different forms of resilience or lack of resilience in that particular area. So exactly what's resilience? And again, if you reflect again on Stephen's presentation, resilience in its simplest form, the diagram on your right is about bouncing back, but it's much more than bouncing back and I'll come to that later on. But it is looking at it from multiple areas, from a physical, from a social, from an economical, from a natural, from an institutional area. Resilience is not just about a social entity. It's about making sure that the infrastructure is resilient, the power system is resilient, the sewer system is resilient. From the social side, from health to awareness to social capital or institution, emergency services has the capacity and ability to respond if there's a particular event. So resilience is looking at it from all these, these um, different um, areas. And if we use the definition from UN, UNI SDR, uh, disaster resilience is the ability of individuals, community, organization, and state to adapt, recover from a hazard, or if there's a stress, without compromising long-term prospect for development. So resilience shouldn't be about getting back to the states that you were before the event. It is about bouncing forward, not just to the initial state. So that's what we're going to explore, why this particular um, area is not even bouncing back or even bouncing forward, so to speak. So we know that in the area, um, there's a high exposure of hazard. It's exposed to tidal flood, pluvial flood, groundwater flooding, um, river flooding from the River Conway, which I pointed out earlier on, groundwater flooding, 
is very low in terms of the topography. There's some area which is actually below sea level because of um, the dunes which have been cleared. So it, it creates these depression and you've got buildings um, in this depression, which makes it below the sea level. So if we get flooding, then the, the flood debt is much higher in that region. But why disaster flood um, resilience is important? Increasingly, it's a strategy of the UK government. They do realize you can't keep building flood defenses. You can't have in hard engineering response. It's important, but it's not feasible, especially in terms of climate change, to continue to build hard defenses. So they're moving towards more resilience, especially community resilience. They also realize that resilient community are those where people within the community, they are unaware of the, they're aware of the risk they, they, they are exposed to. Um, they, they have probably experienced it. And if they know what the risk is, they will take action. And one of those action that you're hoping that they will take is, for example, property level protection, which was the last thing that Stephen Explo um, Explorer explained to you earlier on. So if you know you're exposed to flood, one, you will try to get insurance. Secondly, you'll try to retrofit your house with it's raised in the sockets. You're going to take the carpets out of your house. Um, you're going to put um, non-return valves that water doesn't get in, water can get out, but not in. You raise, for example, the sockets on the wall. So you can put in property level um, resilience measure. Um, flood gates are, you know, guards around your windows, etc. So that's the hope. That's if you're aware of the risk, you will take such action. It also says that if you have resilient community, it has resilient individual and you'll take action to protect your home and protect your family. So we'll explore these through a study I did, whether that was achievable or is it achievable in this particular study area. Now, as I said to you before, resilience is about different aspects from physical, social, economical, institutional resilience. And if you look at the physical um, vulnerability of the area, um, it's quite evident. For one, and you could see, for example, the diagram, the photo at the bottom. It's not, un it's, it's not usual to see this sort of thing in the UK, where there's massive area of unpaved road, there are potholes. It's quite difficult um, to get out of your house without having to wade through water. So it's very unusual, and it's a clear sign of physical vulnerability in the area. You also see, for example, the, the dunes, which uh, natural protector uh, um, for the area. Most of those are in very poor state or they've been removed. You see numerous bungalow houses, which is which are houses at just one level. Houses are poorly maintained. Um, you can see gaps, for example, in the wall where water can get in quite easily. But even more significant is the distribution of caravan parks, mobile homes. And again, the diagram just um, to the top, you can see the spread of um, caravan home. And within that small area, there are over 50,000 caravan. And it's the main you know, income earner for, for, for local residents in terms of tourism. But beyond that, the infrastructure, whether it's road, whether it's a sewage, it is just poor infrastructure, which points to um, very high physical vulnerability. But in addition to that, there's very high socioeconomic uh, vulnerability. Um, and if we look at some of the data from the local council, over 36% of the population claim disability in the, um, and in the context of UK, you know, if you're claiming disability, you're probably on very low income. Um, and that, you know, whole range of from physical to mental disability, which means that impact on employment. In terms of wages, it's just um, over 23,000, which is way below the national average for Wales. Unemployment is just above nat um, national average. So again, there are lots of factors which points to very 
um, high social vulnerability. And when we talk about vulnerability, that has a whole range from your age to your gender, to where you live, to wealth, to income, to education, all of these contribute to um, this um, social vulnerability. Disability, again, that links to, you know, if you're disabled, in terms of if there's a flood, you have challenges in getting out of your house, getting to a safe place, um, your experience of flood, if you're not experienced, you don't know what to do, um, you know, your age, whether it's school children or the elderly are much more vulnerable. Now, again, in the UK, we use what's called the multiple deprivation, index of multiple deprivation. And what's important in this, um, if you look at the numbers, so the lower the numbers in this context, um, the higher the deprivation, which is a direct measure of vulnerability. And you can see there's only one of those area that has value over four real ease, but most of that study area, the, the index, um, they fall in between one and two. There's the odd one, for example, three. So again, point to very high social um, vulnerability. So what we did was to use GIS to, to map out the area of very high um, hazard exposure. We combine that with the physical vulnerability as well as the social vulnerability. And it's not probably not as clear, but the area, the pink, red looking areas, those are the high risk area. And, it, and as you can see, you know, that's almost 40% of the study area is extremely high risk um, of flooding. And we're particularly interested, especially around the physical um, risks um, in terms of buildings. And in total, over 1,600 buildings were at extremely high risk of flooding. So if I go back to the question I asked you before, would you do something if you know your house is, is at risk? And from all indication, most of you said yes. However, that's not the case in, in that particular area. In terms of retrofitting, putting proper delivery protection in, to, you know, it's it's almost minimal, and I'll show you the result in a little while. And to understand that, we had to find out, you know, do a flood perception study. Um, so we did that through a series of interview uh, interviews as well as questionnaire. We tried to sample across the different hazard zones. Um, in total, we interview questionnaired. 174 participants. And the first thing was to look at the impact. And a lot of time when you looked at floods, you know, you look at the short term impact, you know, and by all means, that's what stood out. Um, yes, the house got flooded, house got damaged, the driveway, they talk about the financial losses or loss um, of their business. But sometimes what we don't appreciate and understand is some of the more long-term impact. For example, on family life, um, impact on access to services, transport, disruption to school, which goes on in most instances way beyond the immediate impact, um, uh, the immediate um, event. And as one, uh, you know, res um, respondent indicated that, yes, you know, he was affected, but it's the long-term stress that he faced that you know made existing medical condition even worse. Then we asked, would you move out of the area? And surprisingly, 80%, just over 80% said no. So we explore why you're at risk. You haven't done anything, but you can't move out of the area. And one of the first things they said is we can't get insurance. And how is that important? Because if you can't get insurance, you can't sell a house. No one will buy your house. So they are actually trapped in this particular area. Others said, yes, we have lived here. It's a beautiful place. We want to stay. Um, but the most significant one, which is quite important, um, which we'll come back to, is that they can't afford to. Then we asked about concern. Are they actually aware? Because the, the theory is that if you're aware of flooding, you will actually take action. And by all means, almost 
ever responding, they are aware of the different range of flooding. And this is quite unusual um, for the different areas which I've worked in, because you'll ask about, you know, the risk of flooding and most people don't, they are not aware of one, if they're at risk. Secondly, what are they at risk from? But in this particular area, there's clear understanding that yes, we know we're at risk from sea, from surface water, pluvial floods, from the river, from groundwater, from sewer. Um, sorry about that. Um, and you think, is it because of previous experience or, you know, or if they didn't have uh, um, any experience, and there's no difference in terms of their awareness, whether they have experienced flooding or not in the past. Then the important one about resilience, would they actually take, have they taken measures? And again, over 70% of the, the, the respondents, they have not done anything in terms of, for example, property level protection. There are few, yes, who have, for example, they've bought insurance, they've contacted the flood warden, they have signed up to flood alert, they have got a flood kit, but by large, as I said, almost 30%, they have not taken resilience measure. And there's little difference between permanent residents or temporary ones, for example, those in the mobile home. So why such a low level of personal resilience measure? And it's very simple from our research, it's lack of sufficient income. They just don't have the income to retrofit. There's a smaller percentage that thinks it's their resp responsibility, but most of them think actually it's the government's responsibility. And that's challenging. If you think that it's not your responsibility, even when you're getting flood, it's very difficult to build resilience in this particular area. The next statement there is that government should be doing more. And there's some truth, yes, and I'll get to that later on. In terms of building resilience, the government has to invest more. There are other issues around social resilience, isolation, for example, the poor road, then, you know, and I mentioned the disability, over 36% of the population claim disability, some of that physical disability, they're in wheel um, chair, they can't get out, they feel isolated, they feel, you know, there's a mistrust of um, local government. Again, risk communication, their evidence of their trying to communicate the information to the residents, but there's that level of mistrust. And if there's mistrust, then they won't actually take action um, depending on what the government say. And again, you know, they're informed, um, but they don't trust government. And, you know, when I ask them the question, you know, strongly agree or disagree i have trust in my local authority most strongly agree while they were still informed of the flooding so some key um conclusion out of that there's extremely flood high flood risk um in the area there's very high exposure to a range of um, hazard there is the presence of high physical social vulnerability but there's low resilience. And within this area, there's a lot of unique challenge. It's a blighted community. They can't get insurance. Um, they can't afford to improve their, their, their property. The private roads are extremely poor. There's mistrust of local government. They want government to do more. Now, how do we build resilience in such an area? One, it's about regeneration of that particular area, which hopefully will create jobs. They probably will now be able to afford um, resilience measure. There's need for better access to insurance and the current system of flood re is just not working for the community. And as such, there needs to be other ways in terms of, for example, government granting more grants for property level protection and that property level protection, hopefully will mean they'll now access um, insurance. Um, the caravan parks, they're at particular risk of flooding. How are they going to address that? It's going to be, for example, through having compulsory evacuation plan, proper zonation within that area. So it has to be a combination of factors. The engineering part is very important. The flood defenses need strengthening. 
the social and the economic side also needs to be addressed through employment, regeneration, um, more government grants, for example, property level protection, and protecting the natural system. The dunes, which are natural protective for that particular area, need to be better managed um, in terms of developing new carbon park that needs proper zone laws, which, you know, with clear regulation that if you're going to build in this area, the new structure has to be resistant as well as resilient to flooding. And I think that sort of sums up how do we build resilience? I said, one, engage with community, more investment in hard engineering, protecting the natural system, increase zonation to control development in that particular area, encourage more community groups to become active, include strengthening local voluntary group um, emergency services, um, make mobile parks, um, have, for example, evacuation plan, make those compulsory, Grant needed to retrofit house and access to insurance. It's critical. Flood read really does not work for this area. They need to find other ways of um, helping the community gain access to insurance. And investment in things like drainage to reduce pluvial flooding is quite critical. And probably the most important one is regenerate the area to create jobs, employment, and in so doing, we might be able to build resilience. So I think that's me done. And as I started off, resilience is not about bouncing back, it's bouncing forward. So thank you very much, and I hope you are able to hear me. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, Dr. Miller, we can hear you very well, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, yeah, yes, right. by the end of the presentation, I think this is a very good way of uh, finishing our uh, experts presentation panel because you are the last but not the All least right. of course uh, of the lot yeah, I hope not. <laughs> now I it will be the, the sorry the best for last that's the same absolutely we have left the best for the end but uh, uh, now it's their turn to talk about their own projects which they have been uh, thinking from yesterday and the last uh, picture where you said it's not only about bouncing back, it's about bouncing forward. I think that's the key um, lesson that we can take from this session and actually from all the presentations that we have seen. Um, before I uh, leave the platform to uh, open for question, I have one quick query uh, question for you. Uh, what do you suggest? Um, uh, bouncing back would mean in areas where there is no existing uh, insurance strategy at all or there is lack of trust uh, with the local authorities. As we see, when we look at systems, it's uh, looking at it holistically. But yeah. often in developing nations, the trust is lower with government. Yeah. There are no systems of insurance. We don't see so, any insurance around here. At least in Brazil, there is a, a lack of general lack of insurance in both commercial and uh, residential properties, especially in the flood risk management sector. So, what is your suggestion? How can this problem be pitched to the government or to the local authority or to the community in any way, so that uh, this uh, building in resilience within the community, bouncing back, can be brought forward? I think if you're going to pitch it, it, it's quite, well, I would say it's quite simple, but it's actually quite difficult to pitch to government. But in reality, if you invest one dollar, one pound, whatever your currency is, in resilience measure, you're going to save eight. So whilst in the short term it might look like yeah if you invest you know 10 million in resilience you you, you know you're going to lose that the truth is if you keep trying to spend each time there's a recurring event it's going to cost you much more so, so that's a general pitch that you have to tell government actually this is a cost saving measure in the long term you will save and you can do the calculations that look over the last 10 years how much have you spent on you know, responding to a particular event. And if if the answer is, yeah, I've spent 50 million, actually said you could have saved that 
by investing 10 million in resilience measure. Um, so that's the first pitch. But you can also draw an example from other countries which has done the same. And I don't always like using um, a developed country to compare other country, but there are other middle income countries, for example, Chile is a good mm. example. Yeah. Um, where you can draw an example where they have invested in resilience measure and they're actually reaping you know, the dividends now and some of that money now they're using, for example, around, you know, strengthening education system, healthcare system, you know, in generating more income. So there's benefit there. You can sell it that way. It's about money. In the end, you're going to save money and you're going to save lives. I hope that answers your question in a very round of <laughs> Yeah, I think it, it, it does. Uh, could, you, could you please stop sharing and we would like to see you now? Oh, you want to see me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Is that better? That's okay. Uh, Can you make it full screen? Because it seems like it just has hidden the stage and you are looking very small there. Uh, Can you click on better? your own video? I think it should be full screen. No? Mm. Is that not still? No. Hmm. <laughs> All right. I'm, see I'm seeing you full screen, but yeah. obviously you're not seeing me full screen. No. So we will keep trying on that. Yes, and now I keep, I keep playing around while you yes. ask questions. Yeah. So I'll uh, leave the platform open for questions. So mm, this is your last chance to ask someone from away from here because I'll be here, but they won't be here. So think about any questions. Uh, think about things you are doing and how you can relate it with the uh, experiences um, that you have heard about. What do you think about uh, understanding, uh, including people, participation of people? Are these very new for you? New concepts? So there should be more questions then. <laughs> What do you oh, think? At uh, the yeah. end of the day, they might just be tired, but yes. <laughs> yes, you see? Uh, well, it's, uh, I think it's not that end. It's in the middle of the day. They just had their lunch, so I think they should be all right. <laughs> Any questions at all? Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my good name is Cesar. Uh, we saw your results about, uh, about uh, I want to know which me measures government is doing to help those people that, that show us that uh, many things they should do, but what th they are really doing to help those people? Um, well, well, to answer your question, they are doing something to help, but whether they are doing enough, that's the challenge. So in terms of hard engineering, they are putting in new defenses, they are putting in, for example, more seawalls. They're doing beach nourishment. I don't know if you know what beach nourishment is. So they're doing more beach nourishment. So they're putting in physical intervention. What they're not doing enough of. So it's a very much top down instead of but they're not listening to the residents. And that's where the mistrust comes in. So they're going in, they're putting in these defenses, which are actually spoiling the beach, which then impacts on tourism, which the business, you know, they go out of business, which then means they don't have the measure to put in resilience measure. So they are doing something, but it's not the right thing. Um, so they do need to listen a bit more. They need to invest more on a very local level instead of looking in on a regional basis. Um, they need to, for example, give more grants to individual so they can retrofit their home. They need to give grants in terms of helping them to access insurance. So these are the things they need to listen more to do what the community want, not necessarily what they want to do. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Okay. 
So it looks like um, you have answered all their questions. But Thank in you. case, <laughs> in case uh, they have more questions, we have your uh, email address. Um, okay. I did not introduce you actually <laughs> before oh, you. before the presentation. Yes, but uh, it would be good just to you know follow the performer. I was doing it. Maybe at the end, that's still all right. Um, so Dr. Miller, <laughs> he works with me. So you know, I I forgot to introduce him <laughs> in, uh, to you. So. He is a geoscientist with a particular interest in the development and application of ge a geographical information system on natural hazard management. His research has focused mainly on regions of Caribbean and United Kingdom, investigating the impact that major catastrophes such as earthquake, floods, hurricanes, landslides, tsunami, and volcanoes have on uh, development of cities, the economy, and environment. Beyond this work, um, uh, in the natural hazard management field, he is also an active researcher into the role of mobile technologies. So, for instance, social media, you must be very, uh, that's something, um, Dr. Miller, you should have presented here. Um, uh, next time. Yes. <laughs> and on student learning. So, uh, obviously, uh, he is a person who works in multiple areas. Uh, any questions around that also? And what he has presented today. I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your queries. We have uh, his email address, and shall we give him another round of applause before we say goodbye to him? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller, for joining right. us today. And, Thank you very uh, much, and yeah. enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye.